Well, the, the news is not good these days, right? Uh, the coronavirus seems to be winning right now. And in a couple of weeks, we will need to acknowledge all that we've lost during this challenging time with a service of lamentation. But today, I just wanted to celebrate. This is a celebration of some of God's beautiful gifts to the human family at a challenging time. Listen to this passage carefully, please. This is a little masterpiece from the Hebrew Psalter. Psalm 68. Let God rise up. Sing to God. Sing praises to God's name. Lift up a voice to the one who rides upon the clouds. God's name is Yahweh. Be exultant. Father of orphans and protector of widows is God in God's holy habitation. God gives the desolate a home to live in. God sets the lonely in families. God leads out the prisoner to prosperity but the rebellious live in a parched land. O God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain at the presence of God, the God of Sinai, at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Rain in abundance, O God, you showered abroad, you restored your heritage when it languished, your flock found a dwelling in it, in your goodness, O God, you provide for the needy. Thanks be to God for God's beautiful word. Please pray with me. O God, you've bound us together in this bundle of life. Give us grace to understand how our lives depend on the courage, industry, and honesty, and integrity of our fellow human beings, that we may be mindful of their needs, grateful for their faithfulness, and faithful in our responsibilities to them through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you were a troublemaker and wanted to raise a ruckus, you could attend a conference of zoologists and ask which is the smartest animal. You'd get heated debate and all kinds of answers, chimpanzees, elephants, goats, ravens, octopi, but at least some of those zoologists would answer the cetaceans, whales and dolphins. By some measures, dolphins have the second largest brains proportional to body mass. One whale expert said that dolphins would be running the world if they had opposable foot thumbs. In many ways, cetaceans act just like human beings. Whales live in families called pods. And here's something interesting. Whale species, which gather in smaller pods, have smaller brains. That's a good lesson for us. The more people we hang out with, the smarter we get. And if your network is tiny, well, I just don't know what I can say for you. Whales work together, teach each other to hunt and to use tools, play, grieve, and foster parent. If a whale mother gets sick or dies, another whale mother will adopt her calf. And famously, of course, whales talk to each other. Did you know that whales have distinctive regional accents? One whale sounds like she might come from Mississippi, and another whale sounds like he might live near Boston, like John Krasinski in that Hyundai ad for Smotpock. Years ago, the U.S. Navy developed a hydrophone for locating enemy submarines. As you can plainly hear, a hydrophone is a microphone in the water. In 1989, when a cetologist was using a hydrophone to track whales, he picked up an odd s uh, signal. It was a whale singing at a pitch of 52 hertz, which is a very low frequency. It's just above the lowest note on the tuba, but way higher than the normal song of a blue whale or a fin whale, 15 to 25 hertz. It's almost like this whale's voice hadn't changed yet, even though he was about 40 years old. They call him 52 Blue. Whale experts guess that his vocal cords are damaged or genetically malformed, or perhaps he's a mongrel whale, a cross between a blue whale and some other kind of whale, which happens. Deaf people write the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and suggests that he might be deaf. He's never heard the songs of his pod mates, and so he can't communicate. 
Cytologists have heard this unique whale song off the western coast of the United States almost every summer since 1989. Nobody's ever seen him, but they speculate that he's probably alone because he can't communicate. They don't know that for sure, but the media have had a field day with this. He's going to have his own movie, and he's become known as the loneliest whale. Scientists scoff because we don't know anything about whale emotions, and we don't know anything about this particular whale, but lonely hearts all over the world identify with him or her, turning him into a cipher for their own aloneness. People who feel they are not quite part of the pack keep writing Woods Hole, pleading with them, can't you please help this animal? A 19-year-old college student calls 52 Blue the epitome of every person who's ever felt too weird to love. Those kind of folk are legion. Probably all of us at some point in our lives have felt too weird to love. Father of orphans and protector of widows, says the psalmist. Father of orphans and protector of widows, so is God in God's holy habitation. That is to say, when God is being most definitively God, when God is at God's holiest, God is protecting the abandoned. That protectiveness and companionship are integral to God's very essence. That is one of God's main jobs, central to God's meaning and identity. So this all started, this empty room, on March 13. I have not seen most of you for 121 days. I miss you. Joe and Katie miss you. We feel isolated from each other. And so on Sundays, we have been looking with you at, from a distance at the literally hundreds of promises in Scripture about God's close, constant, conspicuous companionship. Over and over and over again in the Bible, God has promised to give God's very self to us, to the orphan, to the widow, to the lonely, whale or human. But more than that, God has given us each other. Not just God's self, but each other. God gives the desolate a home to live in, says the psalmist. God gives the desolate a home to live in. God sets the lonely in families. The family, says the psalmist, comes from God. It is and always has been and always will be the fundamental unit of human socialization. And whales, too. God sets the whales in pods, most of them anyway. So this is a preposterously simple sermon. I'm not telling you anything you didn't already know. Well, maybe a little bit about whales. You're welcome. All I want to say is, if you love the people you're stuck with, what are you complaining about? I am stuck with the love of my life. Kathy and I adopted Doogie on January 5. How prescient was that? And now my daughter and her husband have come to live with us. And she found a job in Chicagoland, which means she's here to stay for a while. I hope you love the people you're stuck with, too. I know it's not always easy. Twins were squabbling loudly and rambunctiously all day, and finally Mom had had enough, and she pulls them apart, and she says, Stop it right now. How would you like it if your father and I argued like that? And one of the twins says, But Mom, you and Daddy chose each other. We didn't get to choose. He's right about that, yeah? We get to choose our spouse, but we don't get to choose our parents or our children or our brothers and sisters. We're stuck with each other in more ways than one, in families and in quarantine. But look at it like this. Americans, Brazilians, and Russians are banned from traveling to the European Union. If you're an American married to a European, you can go there, but not if you're engaged or in a long-time partnership. So if you're an American engaged to a European, European, if you're supposed to be planning your wedding, if you're in a long-term relationship with a partner, you can't touch your partner. So what are we complaining about? God is very good. God gives the desolate a home to live in. 
God sets the, family, the lonely in families. And not only that, but now we're expanding our understanding about what family is. Neil Gorsuch for crying out loud. He is supposed to be the defender and protector of traditional and conservative values. Who would have expected that he would vote with the liberal justices for gay rights? Well, I'll tell you, everybody who knows him would have predicted that. He attends an Episcopal parish in Boulder that welcomes gay people. In 2008, when now Justice Gorsuch was serving on the U.S. Court of Appeals 10th Circuit, he interviewed a law student for a clerkship, and the law student decided to get brutally honest. He says, look, I'm a liberal gay Jew from New England, and you're an appointee of George W. Bush. Am I going to be comfortable here? He got the job. And years later, when he married his partner, Justice Gorsuch was thrilled. Justice Gorsuch voted that way because he knows and loves gay people. He knows that they're part of the human family and that they deserve their own families. Justice Gorsuch is expanding his sacred universe of moral obligation, and so should we all. Look, there's not much good about this quarantine thing. This coronavirus is a terrible thing, but at least it's teaching us how to enlarge our sacred universe of moral obligation, how to enlarge the human family. In the fields, dairy farmers are dumping millions of gallons of milk into manure pits. And other farmers are plowing under acre after acre of potatoes and onions and vegetables. That's in the fields. In the cities, the line at the food bank is literally miles long. It just breaks your heart. Hungry people over here and excess produce over there destined for the now desolate restaurant industry. But now I have archived at least a dozen newspaper articles about mostly young people who are pairing up hungry people and surplus food. They're like Match.com. They're making beautiful unions. One article was called, We Had to Do Something. These college kids transported 50,000 onions from a farm in Oregon to a food bank in L.A. Just a sliver of the pile that's rotting in the fields, but you've got to do something. And then they rented a truck and delivered 10,000 eggs to another food bank. Papa John's is putting extra cheese on its pizzas to help the dairy farmers. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is spending $300 million a month buying surplus produce for food banks. This turns out to be a double benevolence. It helps the hungry people and the farmers. American Airlines do donated 25,000 airplane meals to food banks. Delta donated 200,000 pounds of food to hospitals. Southwest Airlines donated $400,000 worth of airplane snacks to food banks. How many tiny bags of peanuts and pretzels is that? Five million? United Airlines converted a cargo hangar at the Houston airport into a food distribution center for food banks. United Airlines is in desperate straits right now, but they're doing what they can. And this collaboration between government and business and college students just makes my soul take flight. In Denver, volunteers load dog biscuits and Oreos and spaghetti sauce into their cargo bike and trailer and deliver it to people who are vulnerable and can't go to the grocery store. A cargo bike with a trailer. In Berkeley, two women recruited 750 volunteers to shop for the vulnerable. 750 good Samaritans. One of these women explains, this is not charity, this is solidarity. None of us is okay unless all of us are okay. None of us is safe unless all of us are safe. Did you listen to the way she put it? Not charity, solidarity, family. 
This coronavirus is a terrible thing, but it's helping us find our brothers and sisters. Defender of orphans and protector of widows, so is God in God's holy habitation. God gives the desolate a home to live in. God sets the lonely in families, and the family is huge. We're going to be okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.